with us in school this evening and those accessing our founders lecture online. So welcome to our 2023 founders lecture, our seventh annual event in this series. I introduced this lecture, this event in 2016 with the aim of bringing distinguished speakers to Manchester High to stimulate conversation and broaden perspectives. And on that note, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Ruth March OBE, who left Manchester High in 1974. And she's come to speak to us this evening about her work in biopharmaceuticals, diagnostics, genomics and precision medicine. Ruth is an experienced senior industry leader with an array of scientific and technological expertise in her sector. And she currently holds the position of Senior Vice President of Precision Medicine and Biosamples at AstraZeneca. She's accountable for the development of novel companion and complementary diagnostics for AstraZeneca's drug projects in all therapy areas and phases of drug development. She leads more than 300 diagnostics and biosamples experts globally and has successfully launched 54 diagnostic tests for six precision medicine drugs. She was awarded an OBE in the 2022 New Year's Honours List for her role in developing diagnostic tests for COVID-19 at the very start of the pandemic, which became instrumental in maintaining the supply chain of key medicines, minimising the spread of the She's wrapped up a series of firsts in her work, including the world's first drug label based on circulating tumour DNA, the first FDA approval of a lab-based companion diagnostic, and the first point of care diagnostic for respiratory disease. Dr March is passionate about mentoring, diversity, early career researchers and innovation in life sciences driving important collaborations with diagnostic companies and academic institutions. So for those of you interested in future careers in this field, take note and don't miss out on the opportunity to ask any questions you may have. For those of you joining us remotely this evening, please use the Q&A function to ask any questions. And for those of you here in the room, Please raise your hand at the appropriate point in Ruth's talk. I know she would like to answer as many questions as possible this evening. So without further ado, please give a very, very warm welcome to Dr. Ruth March. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to the mistress and all the organisers for inviting me to join you here this evening. Welcome to all of you online. I must admit, when I first got the invitation to speak here at my old school, I was a little nervous. And I do want to just check with the staff here that the statute of limitations has run out <laughs> for overdue homework, because otherwise I think I might be kept behind <laughs> to complete my Latin homework some years ago. That is correct, you said to me. Right, good. Excellent. So, as was has just been introduced to you, I'm going to tell you something about my career, how I come to be here, and also what has inspired me about this school and other influences in my life to become a, a senior scientist at a pharmaceutical company. I will be looking for your help to tell my story. And I just, again, I would just like to hear that that is all right with you, is it? Yes. <laughs> Did you hear anything? <laughs> um, can we hear it again, please? Is that all right with you? Yes. yes. Excellent. Good. So let's start out with <laughs> why am I here this evening? So the actual moment that I received my invitation to talk to you tonight came when I received this honour from the Prince of Wales last November. And this is uh, an OBE medal. And as you can see, I was in Windsor Castle and received that for my services in COVID testing 
and also contributions to British science. So if anybody hasn't seen one of these before, I'll pass it around. It was a very great honour to go to the castle and receive that. You will notice the hat. <laughs> that was the first time I have worn a hat since my days here at the school, when hats were compulsory and there used to be a mistress who would stand at the end of Grange Fort Road to check that as you got off the bus, you were wearing either your winter hat or your summer hat. And I regret to say that those hats were kept right at the bottom of our bags with all the textbooks on top of them. So you had to dig in into this poor felt hat, unroll it and cram it onto your head. So I did not have a very good experience, if you like, of wearing hats. But on this occasion, I actually got to choose my hat and wear it with pride. How did that story start? Well, I remember this very vividly because I was answering emails at half past nine one evening, right at the beginning of the pandemic on the 18th of March 2020. And this is when we knew something was going on in the Far East, in China. But we didn't really think that it would be anything that would affect us in the UK, in the US and in Sweden. And then I got this email from my boss saying, can we see whether we can develop our own COVID-19 diagnostic tests that we can use to test our employees. And you, in other words, myself and my colleagues, get together with our teams and work out how feasible it would be to do this and how long it would take. And here's the reason why. It will be a top priority to help protect our staff and potentially help us to keep things running by giving people confidence that every time they get a snickle, they are not infected with COVID-19. And then there was a period of about five to 10 minutes when I thought, do I reply to this? Because setting up a COVID test, a diagnostic test like this, particularly for an unknown target like COVID-19, would normally take in the region of six months and we all expected the pandemic to be over in six months. And then we got a reply from my boss's boss, the CEO of the company saying, can we target doing this in two weeks? We are used to basic records. And at that point, I knew I had to respond to the challenge and see if we could certainly try to set this test up in two weeks. So why was this? Now we have three main research centres in AstraZeneca, in Gaithersburg in the US, Cambridge in the UK, and Gothenburg in Sweden. But apart from that, we have many, many more factory sites, and those are the sites that produce the supply of medicines that go to patients in our clinical trials and also patients once the drug is actually released. And what was happening is that those factories in particular are run on a very lean basis. They're mostly automated. There are not that many key staff staff that are in those factories. And therefore, even a small percentage of people staying on work could potentially fault the supply for medicines to patients. That's what we were trying to prevent. So 18 days later, not quite the two weeks, we have an end-to-end -end employee diagnostic testing program in the UK, in the US and Sweden. Now, what was central to this is that we had to go all the way from contacting employees and having a healthcare professional approving the test, which happened via an IT app that our, our IT team set up in more or less a week. So it was a bit of a string of, and uh, sealing wax operation. 
Then we had to collect the sample. Then we had to transport the sample to the lab, which was in some cases quite a long way, for example, from Macclesfield down to Cambridge. Then the sample was tested in the PCR lab in our R&D sites. And then finally, the healthcare professional returned those results. And we got to believe that the healthcare professional, if the employee was positive, would do that by phone, because then we had to agree on next steps. In other words, they shouldn't come into work and infect others. Or if they were negative, that could be just read by the IT app. And if you want to read about that, there is a paper that is published, uh, which is down on the bottom of that slide. And we got it down to a one to two day turnaround because this had to be as fast as possible so that we did not have infected people coming into the workplace. Now, this is where I want you to help me. The initial adoption was only 30% of eligible employees. We were astonished by this. The whole of the UK was crying out for COVID-19 testing. We were providing them with a tailor-made free service, but 70% of our employees weren't taking that up. We couldn't force them to do it. They had to volunteer, but we couldn't understand why that adoption was so low. So we had an independent firm go and ask them anonymously. So can you put your hands up, please, if what you think is the main reason why the adoption was so low? Was it that people did not understand the science? Was it that their local leaders were not communicating that this was a priority? Was it that people struggled with that IT app, which I told you had been very hastily put together? Was it that people were afraid of using the nasal swabs, you remember those long nasal swabs that we used to use, or was it that people needed a rapid result? So was it, who thinks it was number one? Who thinks it was number two? And who thinks it was number three? Who thinks it was number four? <laughs> and who thinks it was number five? Right, so, so all of these factors were important. That's what it turned out. However, you are quite right. The main thing was that people had experience of those early days of COVID testing, where you remember people had to go to drive throughs where the local army were trained, given a couple of hours training, to stick that nasal swab as far up as they possibly could. And either the employee themselves had that experience, or they knew somebody, their wife, sisters, friends, you know, connection, who had a really unpleasant experience, and therefore they did not want to use nasal swabs. So what we did, was therefore to change our whole sample collection to saliva. People had to spit into a tube like this one on the, on the screen. And although it took a bit of work to set up, we could show that that saliva collection was just as good as a nasal swab in giving you a result. Then the IT simplification. So gentlemen over there is absolutely correct. What we found was that particularly in our factories, people were not used to using IT apps. Some of our senior managers found this very difficult to understand. They didn't have iPhones, so we gave them iPads, but they didn't understand iPads either. They didn't know how to swipe up and swipe right and swipe left. So they just found that too challenging. So in the end, what we did was to provide an assisted service. We had a help desk and those were IT professionals actually on the site who would do all of the logging in necessary for individuals. 
And the third thing was the development of these rapid antigen tests so that people who were just visiting for the day could get a result within 15 minutes. As you know, we all ended up using these, but we actually introduced them earlier than a lot of other people. So what we found was that this, bringing all of those measures together, gave us a five-fold increase in adoption rates and therefore in site protection. So this is the scientific graph. So if you can just follow the amber part, and the amber part in the first month is around 30%. And then it stays at about that level. It actually goes down a bit over the summer and then it starts to climb. And it ends up with nearly 100% of eligible employees were willing to test. Then what you see in Mulberry is the external rates of positive tests. And in comparison, what we had at the AstraZeneca sites were tenfold lower than the rates externally. So our measures were being effective in keeping that, that positive infection out of our workplace and helping people feel safe. So the outcome of all of that was the end of the pandemic. Not a single manufacturing line for medicines was closed by workplace infection all around the world. So that was absolutely remarkable. And in fact, when we started to do research again, our research into cancer and other diseases continued without interruption. We had many people telling us, and actually they're still telling us, that they felt safe because they knew that not only they were not infected, but all their colleagues around them were not infected because they had been tested. And very importantly, we learn lessons that could be applied to leadership in general and diagnostic testing. OK, so let's now take another step back and look at where did it all start? And you'll notice that this is a picture of the school from your website, but this is one of the very few parts of the school that I still recognise as being the same as when I was here as a girl. So actually my journey to Manchester High started earlier than that, and it started a few decades earlier. My mother came to this country on what's called the Kinder Transport as a refugee from Nazi Germany. If she had not escaped from Nazi Germany, I would not be here today. And that was very important to us, to both my parents, who emphasised the need for education as a way to overcome all sorts of prejudice that took place during the war and made their lives so difficult. So my parents had this emphasis on education and this school also had a heritage of helping people from different refugee groups, as I believe it still does today, and also welcoming people of the Jewish faith. And there, uh, there is proof that it's me at school. You may not, this is a really poor quality to put a drop, it's the only one I've been able to find. Um, but believe me, that girl there outlined in red, it's myself at about 14. But would my teachers, would I have predicted that I would end up here as an expert in science with all the glowing uh, testimonials that, that have been read out? How well do you think I did in my first year of science test? Again, I'm going to ask you to put your hands up. Was it between 0 and 20%? Was it between 21 and 
Formulated between 61 and 75 percent. Or was it above 76 percent? Well, I'm delighted to say that you are all wrong. <laughs> In my first year science exams, my result was so low that my very considerate teacher didn't actually read it out loud. She came to tell me privately afterwards. Just as I'm not going to announce it now, I will tell you privately if you want to come and ask. It was very low. And it was amazing that I was allowed to do science after that result. So I was certainly not predicted to have anything to do with science after that. My subjects were mostly in the arts, English, history, music, and those were subjects that I enjoyed and therefore worked hard at. I did not enjoy science and therefore I did not I'm great to say, work hard at it. However, as I went forward and I continued into senior school, and my teachers allowed me to take biology and physics at senior, senior school. I actually got enthralled by what I would call the mysteries of science. So things like if I would be in the school grounds and I would look up at some of the tallest trees, how did the sap of that tree actually get the topmost leaves? And the fact that when I looked at my textbooks, it wasn't a hundred percent answer to that. There were things that contributed, like transpiration, like pillar reaction, but nobody could actually put forward a formula and say, this is it, this is the answer, just learn this and that's the answer. So that sense of mystery of things still to be discovered was something that fascinated me. And then something that continues to this day, when you look around different people, you can see that they look different, different gender, different hair color, and other things that maybe would lead you to suppose that there's some underlying differences between them. And nobody could explain what that was. Some things we obviously know are due to differences in the way that people are brought up. Other things may be because you're an introvert or an extrovert. But apart from that, what are those other differences? And that grew to interest me very much and something that I took forward then into my university career. Again, Chris Tom. So this time, we're going to go through this quite quickly. I want you to put your hands up if you think this statement is true, and then we'll come back at the end and consider the answers. So is it true that the DNA that you are born with contains all the instructions your body needs to grow? Who thinks that's true? How many bases, letters, is an end-to-end -end molecule of DNA? That's called your, your genome. Is it 3 million? Or is it 3 billion? Who thinks it's 3 million? Who thinks it's 3 billion? Okay. If I took the DNA from your cells and stretched it out, would it measure Six feet? Or would, would it measure six billion miles? And is it true that humans share over 99% of their DNA sequence with other humans? Is it true? that humans share 60% of their DNA sequence with bananas. <laughs> okay, so number one, 
the DNA that you were born with contains nearly all the interactions your body needs to grow. There are some changes that happen after birth, which also explains, if you like watching crime mysteries, why identical twins are not truly identical. You can actually tell the difference from the DNA. As you said, the end to end molecule of your DNA, your genome, is 3 billion letters long. The next one, number three, is a trick question. Both of those answers are true. So if you took the DNA from a single cell, it would be six feet long, one cell. But if you took the DNA from every cell in your body, it would be six billion miles long, which is just astonishing. And you are completely correct, humans share over 99% of their DNA sequence with other humans. Whether it's 99 or whether it's 99.9 .9, depends a bit on what you measure. And correct, humans do share 60% of their DNA with bananas, which puts it into perspective. <laughs> Very good. So I went on from school and I started my career in science. I went to Hull University to study botany and zoology for various reasons, which again I won't go into now. Um, and I then did a PhD at the Medical Research Council of the hospital in a hospital in London, which actually in Whitechapel no longer exists. It's now part of Bart's Hospital. And then I did various postdocs at uh, University College London and at the University of Oxford. And finally, I took up a lectureship at Brunel University in London. And at that point, I had the opportunity to join AstraZeneca. And the reason I had the opportunity was because before I went to Brunel, I had written, I was about to be unemployed, and I had written to every single place I could think of that were offering jobs. And it was only after I started at Brunel that AstraZeneca wrote back and said, we think we have an opportunity that might suit you. Would you like to come for an interview? So why would I come to an interview at AstraZeneca? Again, I'm afraid that the reasons are quite practical. I have two very small children at this stage that didn't sleep. The idea of having two nights in a very comfortable hotel bed was immensely appealing. And the hotel even had a spa so I could go swimming on my own. It's great. But as I went through that interview, I came to realise that again, some of the interviewers were talking about my favourite question, which is, what is it about individuals that makes them different? And in this case, they were talking about a subject called precision medicine, which is why people respond differently to medicines. So I joined AstraZeneca and gradually through the years, I moved into the subject of precision medicine. So precision medicine is quite a simple idea. It's founded on this idea that people are different. They have tiny little differences in their in their bodies and their cells, not only DNA, but proteins, other enzymes, other sorts of differences, which we call biomarkers. And so what we're doing here is to identify the patient, again, taking a sample in the same way that we did for the COVID-19 testing, looking at those biomarkers and then having a diagnostic test which can inform the treatment options. So any of you who have friends or family who particularly gone for cancer treatment here, if you've gone to the Patterson or Christie Hospital, you will likely have seen an informed consent that allows the physicians and the scientists there 
to test their sample for molecular markers. That will help the, the doctors, the physicians, guide the patient, have a discussion about their treatment options and really tell them which medicines are likely to be best for them. And that's something we've never been able to do before. So we at AstraZeneca have a record of approving the diagnostic tests that we need for this subject of precision medicine. We have our first approval back in 2009, and then we've gone on approving more and more diagnostic tests around the world until the present day. And these get steadily more complex and more imaginative. So now we're not only looking at physical biomarkers, but we're also looking at uh, devices that are called software as medical device where all of these variables that the patient may have, including their clinical characteristics, we can use a program to work out what is the best biomarker, what is the best set of those, of those biomarkers that will predict the future response to a medicine. And all of this has led us to a vision. We now have a vision in AstraZeneca that we want to eliminate cancer as a cause of death. We want to turn cancer into a chronic condition, which means that eventually the patient will pass on, but it will not be from the cancer. And we see this as being possible, this cure as being possible, when we have early and continued diagnostic testing and treatment for patients that are identified as being at risk of developing disease. And this leads us to this concept of keeping patients in a virtuous circle where we have rapid and patient-centric diagnostic solutions detecting that disease very early. And that enables us to guide the best therapy to eliminate premature death. And some of the factors here are to detect disease even before it starts showing symptoms. Then we have to have long term monitoring. And then, as I said, we're using the power of data and artificial intelligence. This is a bit more technical for those of you that are interested in the subject. So where we are now is on the left hand side of this slide where we diagnose patients mostly by imaging, but at that point, the tumour is already quite large. And that means we can treat that tumour, but only to a certain extent. We'll only knock it back to a certain level. Then the tumour will inevitably regrow, and eventually that will lead to death. If we can diagnose earlier when that tumour is at a much smaller volume, then we can knock it back with treatment so that it's almost at the level that a healthy person would have. If it does reoccur, we'll be monitoring that and again we can knock it back. And that's where you get the prospect of long-term survival and cure. We're not there yet, but we're working towards this. What do you think this is? Anybody? So you remember how I told you about the sequencing of the human genome uh, many years ago, although the complete so-called complete sequence was only published in 2022. The sequencing of the human genome took armies of people all around the world millions of dollars, rooms full of big sequencing machines. This little machine here, which I could hold in my hands, if it's roughly the size of a Mars bar, I could take a blood sample from any one of you. I could have your entire genetic sequence probably by breakfast time tomorrow morning. And this machine is designed to be used in the field, it's been designed to detect 
infectious agents, lively virus for COVID-19, it can be used in underdeveloped regions of countries and therefore it's actually going to be one of those things that we hope will bring a revolution to the technology of detecting disease. And it's using techniques like this where we think we can transform monitoring to patient-centric solutions. So as you probably know, again from your families, if somebody is seriously ill, they spend half their life in hospital. And hospital going in for monitoring, for checkups, for treatment, is not a happy place to be. So what we're trying to do now is to either move those solutions into the family doctors, into the GPs, or even into the patient's homes, so that they can be using devices like that and carrying on with their normal lives for as long as possible. And this is what something which um, Sir Simon Stevens, who was then Chief Executive of NHS England, described as what it sounds like sci-fi, it's now becoming a reality. So another thing that I had to learn when I moved to AstraZeneca was to lead. There came a point in my career where I wasn't supervising four or five people. I was being asked to lead a function of over 100 people and quite frankly I found that very intimidating. I had some good experiences and actually part of my experience again was from this school. The one part that I did know how to do was to get up on the stage and prepare for a performance as part of the school orchestra and also know how you had to follow a conductor and how everybody had to play together to get a good result. So this is a few years ago, my team is now bigger than this. But this is the this is the joy of having an entire team aligned and trying to do the same thing, which was to actually deliver to patients. So another question. For those of you that are in work or those of you that are thinking about your future careers, what is the most motivating thing that you can think of? Is it money? Is it earning a good salary? Anybody? Is it having job security and pension? Those sort of things. Is it recognition, being recognised as being the best in your field? Is it helping others? Is it having the freedom to create something of yourself that you're going to leave for future generations? Is it having the best managers and colleagues around you? So again, you're all right. All of these things are motivating. There's been lots of research done on it that human beings need a certain level of job security and reward to make them feel that work, that work is worth doing. We need to be able to support our families. But there are certain points where the motivation is more than anything else. To me, this came home with this picture here. This is my fourth cousin, Becky, in San Francisco. And I only became aware of Becky when she started doing some detective work around where our family had ended up. So she's, she's um, somebody that I met in Germany at the family reunion, and I get on very well. So I went on a work trip out to San Francisco where I have some staff and I took the evening to meet Becky and go for the best ice cream in the region. Now, Becky was diagnosed after I'd known her a couple of years 
with late stage ovarian cancer. And obviously I was very concerned about that, that I am not allowed as an AstraZeneca employee to give medical advice. So I have to be very careful not to influence Becky into what she should be doing. She went on a, a clinical trial, taking a medicine that was invented by another company. And I said, that's very good you're on the clinical trial because research says that people on clinical trials often do better than people, other people. But she didn't respond to this drug. And then after a couple of years, we had a trial that read out that was particularly spectacularly successful in people who had a certain biomarker or mutation in BRCA2, BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. And at the same time, Becky wrote to me and said she had had a test result and she had a mutation in BRCA2 gene. So I thought, OK, I can't give her medical advice. I simply took the press release from this trial and I sent it to her without comment. She took that headline to her treating physician. He put two and two together and she was switched onto our drug. And that was five years ago. And as you can see, Becky is perfectly well. She is not suffering any side effects. And she's able to do everything that she wants to do. She can travel, she can walk her dogs, she can, yeah, do what she wants to do. Now, the important thing about this is this is what makes sense to me. This is what is motivating to me is the number of patients and those patient, patient stories who will benefit from what I'm doing. I had to give a talk at, right at the beginning of when our function was set up. And the people in my function were asking me, what is the strategy? What is going to be the future of our department? But at the same time, I knew that my boss was thinking about closing the department. So I could not go to those people and say, well, you might have a job next week, but actually you might not. And that's, if you like, that's going back to what we asked about, having the job security and having that basic level of reward to support people's families. What I could tell them about was about the story and our delivery to patients. And that's what I did. And everybody in that meeting found it so motivating that even though there were individuals after that who were made redundant, by the way, they all got jobs afterwards, so I, I followed them up and made sure of that, that they did not have any resentment because they understood that what we were doing was for the benefit of patients. That was a very difficult time as a leader. So as I'm coming to the end, I want to go back with all that experience. What would I have told my younger self? And this is, again, you probably can't see that, but when you see the red circle, that is actually <laughs> the year before I joined Manchester High. Uh, I, I was, I joined Manchester High at 10. I was, because I was born in October, I missed the last year of primary school, which is my excuse for why I don't understand fractions. <laughs> so this is what I looked like when I joined Manchester High. So the first thing that I would tell my younger self is to learn what you enjoy. Because basically your best, you will put the most effort into what you enjoy. I saw that other people in the school loved to exercise and they built muscles. I wasn't particularly good at games. But what I did enjoy was reading and studying. And what I grew to appreciate was how that repeated exercise of your brain actually builds muscles and connections in your brain as well. 
I had other things that I did outside of school. I loved riding horses, I still do, and I loved swimming. And we did have the, what was then, the new swimming pool completed, and I got swimming in that pool. Um, during the pandemic, I did to go to appreciate swimming in the outdoors, and this was my New Year's resolution to actually get into Lake Windermere over New Year in a wetsuit, a very thick wetsuit, um, just to make sure that I could still do something a bit out of the way. If I had stretched myself a bit more, I think, at school, by not only learning what I enjoyed, but learning to enjoy what I was learning, then I think I might have saved myself some trouble in actually the, the teaching that I was being offered here. I would have had to go to night school to repeat that one science exam that I never took at school. The other thing that I would say is you are taught here to study and to do well and to be competitive. When I was at school, it was sometimes a very high pressured environment. I don't know if that's still true today. I expect that it is. But you will go through those periods where you feel the pressure. And it's at those times that you need your friends. And in some cases, those friends that you make at school will be friends for the rest of your life. This is one of my best friends at school and my sister-in-law, I won't tell you which, which is which to preserve privacy, but I really appreciate those friendships even today. And also, if anybody does start to suffer with the pressure, it's friends who spot that. It's not teachers, sometimes it's not even parents. It's the friends who will spot if somebody starts to go a bit quiet, or drop out of social activities, it's really important that we take care of each other. And I'll end with something that I took from your website, which completely resonated with me. What you get from this school is the confidence, obviously the academic advantage, but also that spirit that one day you are going to make a difference. You can make a difference to the world that is meaningful. And believe me, if with my start to science in this school, leading to where I am today, if I can do it, anybody can. So thank you very much for listening. And I'm really happy to take any questions. Just shouting out. <laughs> <laughs> what was your least favourite subject in school? Ah, OK, now I have to confess. Well, um, the subject that I kept mentioning where I had my lowest results was chemistry. And that's the one where I didn't take chemistry at school. After that, if I had exam result, I had to go to night school to pass by the equivalent of the GCSE. And that was very hard work. And I, I do wish that I had tried a bit harder when I was at school. You've done so much, what's next? What's next? That's a, that's a great question. Well, we are, we are continuing along that vision of trying to stop cancer being a cause of death. That means that we're working with ever more novel technologies, working with more and more patients in different settings, basically trying to take the lessons and the testing to the patients rather than expecting them to come to the hospital. What 
What has been the most challenging aspect of your career so far? Yeah, it's difficult to pick out one thing that is challenging because the challenge is always in the thing that you're doing at the moment and then you get over that. So you actually achieved it always at the time you think, am I actually going to do this? Then you find a way through. And then afterwards it's the next thing and you can't imagine what you found the challenging about the thing that you've actually achieved. Do you do any academic work or is most of your time is occupied by French? Yes, um, so I do academic work, not as a, I sometimes do invited lectures, which I enjoy very much. And I tend to accept invitations, particularly from student groups in Cambridge. And I also contribute to collaborations with academics, some of which are much bigger and better than we could ever do internal to AstraZeneca. So, yes. What have you had to sacrifice to be in the position that you are in now? Yes, good question. Um, I think what I have sacrificed is free time. As I said right at the beginning, I was on that computer at half past nine at night to receive that email. On the other hand, I get bored very easily. So I don't actually see that as a very great sacrifice. So you talked about um, the fascinating and fantastic developments in technology. Do you think the UK health um, agencies and the NHS are ready to take advantage of all the technology and all the great work? Yes, yeah, so what we found during the pandemic was that we in the UK actually led in technology development. Everybody worked together, the NHS, the government, uh, academics, ourselves in industry. It was a very informal and intense environment and therefore we progressed very fast. Whether that will continue is another question and probably not one I can answer. The ladies have the same question. Are you okay to go into the tail the day that you receive the the one being the test? I'm curious about Sorry, I think you're the award that, that you got. Are you happy to talk about that day or how it was? But how was it? The day when we received your the yeah. challenge for yeah. the setting up the test. No, 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 the OBD. OBD, yes, yeah, yes, I'm happy to talk about that. <laughs> it, was, Sorry, yes. it, was, it was a very special occasion. It was, um, had a lot of preparation. It almost felt like a second wedding because we were so much attention on uh, getting an outfit and getting a hat. We were given a protocol for all of those things. You have to wear it. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, but how to wear a hat. And apparently it was a hat and not a fascinator because the coin reverse hats. So all of those sort of things were written down and handed to us. Also, that was actually my second appointment. So what we may, some of you may have noticed is that that was a summer outfit. And yet I got my OBE in November. And the reason for that was before I had an appointment in June, at Buckingham Palace and before that I went to two work meetings, one in Chicago and, and one in Barcelona and when I came back I got Covid. <laughs> so ironically having got a, a, an OBE for Covid testing I had to ring them up and say sorry I got a Covid test so I don't think I ought to come and then they rearranged it to November. We've just got a lovely comment online uh, from somebody who works at the AstraZeneca site in Macclesfield uh, who wanted to say that she's extremely grateful for the COVID testing they were given on site as she worked on site throughout the pandemic. It made her feel very safe and also meant 
I felt able to visit my parents knowing that I was negative. So that's some appreciation from your Thank colleagues you, there. And um, can I can I thank Ruby on behalf of everybody who's here this evening and who's at home? Um, I hope you do get your own back. I don't know. Slightly <laughs> worried about that. <laughs> um, but I think the achievement of, of making sure and contributing to that team that made sure that AstraZeneca's work wasn't interrupted is absolutely staggering. And I think for somebody who's such an expert in the field, particularly with precision medicine, I've learned so much this evening and that you did so poorly about these seven tests. <laughs> How amazing is that? And what an inspiration to all of us. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much for your inspiring talk. And we are incredibly proud that you started at Manchester Hall. Um, and Eve, our head girl, has just got a small thank you for the very much. Thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you everyone for coming this evening. I'm sure that you enjoyed it as much as I do. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you.